did you grow up? What was your community like when you were growing up? Oh, well, growing up in the St. Thomas, we back in the 60s, mid 65, that's when I was born. I was born there uh, in the St. Thomas. Growing up there, man, it was fun. It was fun. We did a lot of things as a kid to where that, you know, playing football every day was a sport, basketball every day, playing tag games, running through the neighborhood. You know, at that time, that's all we had to do. And go swimming. We, we, we did a lot of swimming during the summertime, you know, a lot of bike riding. I mean, you know, we built our own skateboard, a lot of skating on holidays, like Christmas. We get the iron skates and we skate in the street or whatever. But back in the day, they were playing all the old jam, you know, the OJ, the Supreme, you know, a lot of Motown stuff that we used to listen to. You know, we wasn't really into music, you know, because you know we didn't have a major radio station that I know of back then. But you know, you know, your mom had the little component set with the 45s or the big albums, whatever, and they just played the good music. You know, we we just, you know, you had TV, but we didn't watch TV all day because it was outside most of the time. And you had live bands you used to play. You know, in our neighborhood, we had a band. Uh, they used to play for the neighborhood, you know. They used to have talent shows. Police department put on talent shows back in the days, and then you just play your talent. So that's where our part of music came from, for doing the talent show wise. That's when they had a big city wide talent show, you know. So that was a big part of society. I mean, uh, well, they were holding inside the project. Uh, uh, the police would, uh, would get a, a big major traveling stage, and they would set it up either at the major playground or inside of a front courtyard. And they would just do the big talent show from there. I mean, whoever signed up, you know, you do your audition, you know, weeks in advance or whatever, and then you just play your talent, you know, uh, you know, maybe two, three months later. So that was a real major event back in the day. Citywide New Orleans Police Talent Show. What were what's your first memory of making music yourself? Well, making music when I started, I started way back in ninety two. But if you can go a little further than that, when I used to listen to music when I was in college, I used to do a lot of beatboxing on a microphone and, you know, uh, you know, doing what, the, doing what the average kid that was doing in college at the time when, when the fat ball was out, a crush groove was out, you know, we was imitating them. So I believe that's my first sound because I can do sounds, you know, like, like that. I used to copy them all the time. So that's my first sound of music as far as me doing it and doing it live on the mic that people remember me in college when I used to do at the end of parties, you know, so that was my first touch of it. And then um, the influence of Mr. D. Tucker. 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 I knew Tucker when he was a youngster. As a matter of fact, I taught him football. He was a little running back back in the days, you know. And uh, never thought he wanted to do music when I was in college. Never thought he wanted to do music. But when I was graduating, a friend of mine gave me a tape of Tucker. And, you know, back then we DJed in the project a lot of time before I went on to college and come back every, you know, every holiday I come back and I still be DJing. Didn't know that he created an album and it was, it was well, a song, which was different, what he had, what he had, you know. And, 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 and it was so strange because you hear all the things that people were saying in the street, he was saying it and it was catching on to it. And, you know, like I said, my brother was like a little slash manager with him, taking him from show to shows and showing him how to get paid. And, and, and I remember he asked me a question. He said, you, making $400 is a lot of money. And I look at that time and our age and our, you know, in the state of music and people working and you make more money doing that than we do a summer job. Summer job, your whole check might be four, maybe four, five hundred dollars the whole four or five weeks you're working. And you're making a hundred dollars for 10 minutes. I mean, uh, four hundred dollars for 10 minutes. So I told him, yeah, that's, that's a nice change. So that was our first encounter after, you know, I started hearing him on the tape, talking on the tape, saying what he was saying. It was, it was crazy. I thought it was crazy because people were listening to that and they was chanting to that, you know, talking about the outfit, trick, better have my money, you know, stuff like that. So that was real creative of him to start that era of music. A lot of people talk about um, him and Soul Trap and all of those um, kind of early, the ones that came later as being so influential because people were for the first time talking about local stuff. Right. Well, we had, well, this is a little history. We had artists way before Tucker, but it wasn't bounce, but it was it was New Orleans music. 
far as you had the people like Three Nine Posse, you had people like MC Thick, Bust Down, you know, Warren Mays. These are people who were in the game that when we was coming up, we started listening to our own New Orleans music, as far as Gregory D and Manny Fresh when they had their little hit out. You know, uh, it was, we had our uh, rappers, but they wasn't like they are now today, especially in the bounce era. They was just getting to know, opening doors up. Cause Bust Down had a deal with two live crew and Warren Mays had got a deal with Atlantic Records. And, you know, and, and, and you know, we, we didn't really see it at that. Greg Dinam had a little, uh, a, a little record deal too, but we didn't see it as that being a major step because it was a quiet kept deal. It wasn't a big major promotion and they had to go somewhere to do the advertising. But over the years, you know, New Orleans was known for doing something, but not something major like it is now. So I think um, at least it's been written that you were performing out of high school play and that some producers saw you and took photos and that's how that happened. Yeah, yeah. A guy named uh, Henry Holden, you know, which, you know, which is the mayor of St. Thomas, and his friend, uh, Earl Mackey. What happened was that I used to DJ at Walter Alcorn Senior High School dancing, and it was one of the hottest dances in the summer. I mean, we... We get danced every week. That's how packing used to be. And as we in there, we was creating new things. I was saying stuff on the mic, making up stuff. And other areas was bringing up different dance, like the Eddie Bow was real, real hot coming from the Magnolia. And then you had a jerk, baby jerk coming from the Calio. So everything was hot. And what happened was that they had a rap group, Jay Shirey. And they wanted to promote them. So I asked Henry, I said, Henry, won't you come to Corn Dance? Let them perform. So they get noticed. And that would happen. And what happened was that when they performed, they did a real good job because it was new music. You know, and they felt like booting up and, you know, it was a good song. And now they got notarized. But then I grabbed the mic and did what I've been doing in the gym, which was making up different things. Like we were doing the Beanie Weenie in front of St. Thomas. And we were doing, you know, all kind of shaking like a dog and stuff like that. And so one day, like I say, I sat down in, in class when I was teaching over at Walter Corn Senior High School. I started writing a rhyme to it as I was saying, it, you know. Uh, sweat so hard, you know, uh, pass the tower, do the Eddie Bow, and stand up tall, yeah, yeah, do the Jubilee, all. Oh. So when I did that, it became a major look for them because they were shocked to see me having the whole gym doing the same thing. And it was, it, it was amazing to them. So as they seen that, they came back and asked me, hey, man, would you like to sign a contract to the label? I, I'm young. I don't know nothing about music business because I wasn't thinking about being a rapper at the time. I was a, a major DJ. That's my, you know, that was my my forte, my tool, being a DJ. And so they, they kept coming, they kept coming to the school, but they made it easy for me. They say, well, look, you sign a contract, you don't owe us anything, we don't, you, know, you don't owe us nothing, we just want to make a few dollars and show you how it worked. And they, you know, they read a the contract to me, I didn't really read it, I just signed it, because you know, it, it was something new. But they gave me a big percentage, which was 50-50, and on my record sales, it was 20-80. So I got the majority of everything. I don't owe them nothing. We go 50-50 on tapes and CDs, I get 28 in my shows. I get 80 on my show. They get 20. Hey, that's a good deal. Young cat coming up. Lo and behold, didn't know I made a street tape. Blew up. Didn't even know it was going to blow up. Had a little street tape that uh, a, a little local DJ of mine was selling it. And I didn't know because I heard my tape in somebody else's car. So I had to ask him. I said, are you selling my tapes? He said, uh, yeah. So that's when I knew I had to get to the studio real, real quick because people wanted it. It was like a 10-minute street tape that I did. we did inside of a house. And then when that happened there, you know, we you know, went to the studio, we got it done in two, three days, and take four, shipped it off, and came back. We only ordered 500, put them in the local stores. Ten minutes later, they were calling back again. 500 tapes gone in like 30 minutes. So that's when they knew Jubilee was hot. That's when it started, Jubilee was hot. And the, uh, the influence of Stop Pause has been huge over the years. Yes, yes, yes. Been 20 years since Stop Pause took over, and it was different. Now, nah, out of Stop Pause, you're going to learn another history. There was a new lady named Karen Cotello. She's not living anymore, but she was the one who interviewed me at a concert at Tremay Center. And she would ask me what type of music I do. I said, I'm doing this dance type, make people hype, call it bounce. But even though we had Everlasting Hitman saying bounce, baby, bounce, we never called it bounce yet. We never called it bounce. Nobody knew it. We never called it bounce music yet. But when she interviewed me, I said more like bounce music to make you dance, make you move, represent your neighborhood, your school. And so when she did that, she put in the newspaper, Biggest Cup, bounce music, take over New Orleans. And that's when Jubilee, wow, blew up some more. Kids was craving, kids wanted to know what are the dances. And, and that was my whole thing. When I went to go see Dave Chiray and a whole bunch of artists, MC Thicknam, that Warren Mays gave a big concert for, 
at the Municipal Auditorium for five dollars. He had all the rappers from the West Bank, downtown, Nightwall, everybody. He put in this one big concert, gave him five dollars. And I was very impressed with Deja Rhythm because they were doing the same thing that I was doing, making people dance. But they didn't have single dance, but they, they just had male dancing in the background of them. And so when that happened there, that's when I knew I had something special as far as the dance wise. And that's when, like I said, when I put all these, all these dancing on one song, it took off. It just had every kid, every school, high school, club, talent show, even the band wanted to do it. So when they did that, that's when Jubilee really hit the market. That's when, when, when Bounce was really created. We weren't saying Bounce, but Tucker was saying, we were just saying, you know, just that, that music. You know, so when that label came to it, a lot of people don't know that. Every time I tell that story, they'd be surprised where it come from. And it came from the newspaper. That's how Bounce really got his word. Bounce music. What about DJing? Um, let's back up for a minute. What really about DJing interested you and made you want to follow that route? Well, maybe want to follow that route with my brother. They had a group. Used to be on the Louisiana Parkway. You know, him and his high school buddies, they formed a little group. And they used to do a lot of parties. And, man, I wound up at a block party on, on Louisiana Parkway, and it was crowded. I'm like, whoa. So, you know, we was real tight. And, and, and they had equipment by the house, and I just was interested and, and wanted to DJ because it was something good, playing music. Never thought about it before then until they started DJing. So I started seeing them traveling all over doing different parties. And they used to do house parties and the project, stuff like that. So I see, hey, that's what I want to do. So he bought me a little Capona set, Sansui, with some two little speakers, real powerful. And I was DJing, clicking the button, channel one, channel two, channel one, channel two. And ever since then, I just fell in love with DJing over the years. So got started in 1982 when we formed my own group called The Fellas. It was like about maybe 15 or 20 of us. And we all grew up in a project, played football together. And, and what we did when we formed that group, you only had maybe four or five DJs. It's myself, all the baby brothers used to call them Nigga Nerd. And you had Slick Rick, we called him Ricky D. And then you had, uh, who else it was? Oh, then, uh, then you had Bubba. Then you had a few others on the other side. They, used, they was doing it, but wasn't really into it. They were just hanging around, carrying the speaker's brain on there, and we all go together. So that's why that would make me fell in love with DJing, because then you had the other DJs like Slick Leo and uh, DJ Maniac and Carrier and all them cats from way back in the day, down around with the Sugar Hill game. You had all them cats, and I used to go watch them DJing different projects from the Magnolia to the Desire, to the Iberville. So I was there following them everywhere to go to the Superdome dancers. And that really made my passion for the music and see what influence it had on us. So that, that was my whole passion of being a DJ. And then, um, well, in terms of your musicianship, what inspired you to start doing Well, yeah, I really can't explain it because you, it's, it's, I ask myself that question, how do I make up stuff when people say something? You know, it takes a special talent person to, to, if you say anything and I can create something and make it bigger, you know, I never thought about it. Like I said, when I, I, I wasn't in the music business and I can't remember as far as why that came, but, but, but the thing is now, I'm more attentive to it now, I meaning I can do it on a, on a spare of down. I can make up stuff just by watching. I can make up something just by looking at you. You might walk a certain way, and I can make that out of dance because that's the creativity I see that I know that can catch people's attention. And it's all about catching your attention. I mean, you have people that try to imitate, duplicate, but they're not really there. But you, you just have to be something special. I make up a lot of things on the mic. I mean, you can be in a club holding a drink a certain weight, and I might make up something holding put your drinks in the air, let your pinkies pinky swing or something like that, whatever it is, and it just be creative because – you got to study it first. Some people just do it and try to do it, but you can't do it. You just got to have that raw instinct, natural talent. It's, it's just got to be in you. I mean, you don't go, you don't go study that. You don't, you don't read any magazines or books. You just happen to have raw eye talent to see what will work and what not work, and what to use and not to use. Tell us about um, maybe a dance that came out of the song that you did and uh, started that 
Well, I say one song that really started me off was the Being and Winning. That was one of the first original dance that we created in the St. Thomas by a guy named, we called him Beanie, Beanhead, but his name, but, but we called it Beanie Weenie because it just looked like you're swinging young. It just rhymed with it. Beanie Weenie, it just rhymed with it. So when we created that, that was one of the top dances that came out that way. That when I add the name to it, excuse me, in the way we did it, I had two friends of mine on the side and they had dark glasses on it. And they'll have a contest on the, on the side that we do the beanie weenie and, and it was like this here. And then it was gone. And they're looking at each other. And by they doing this movement with the hand and the arm and bringing it up and bringing it down and bringing it to the front, leaning back, it really created something eye-catching that everybody wanted to do. So when I started doing the beanie weenie in the high school dance and bringing them there and letting them perform it, girls were screaming. They were just going crazy. So that's how creativity of a good dance that you know, you know. And one dance that's still strange to me, that when you say kick your dog, kick your dog, kick your dog, nobody don't know why you kick your dog. Because I, I had a I had a friend, was it was a uh, sissy boo, that's why she came up too damn through the sissy boo and kick your dog. She created that because she had a little puppy with her, and the puppy kept biting on the pants leg. While we was in the dance, they, they, you know, they just had it with it in the jump, in the little gym, and the dog kept biting on the pants leg. And I just said, kick your dog, kick your dog, kick it, and that's how that was created. So that's how you got to be creative on certain things. You just can't say, oh, kick that dog. No, it's got to be creative in how you say, it. kick your dog, kick your dog, kick it, kick it, kick your dog. So that's why that's one of the dances that people don't really understand how you kick a dog. But you're not actually kicking the dog. You're trying to get the dog stopped from the dog from biting you. So that's what I mean. That's creativity. You got to be in you to do that. After 95, after the stop clock just totally blew up, um, then what was the kind of next step that took you to the next level in your career? Well, I had a little setback at first on my Southmore album when I did Jubilee and the Cartoon Crew. But that just something I just felt that I had so many kids following me. And at that time, Boyner was hot and a lot of cartoon characters I was hot on TV. So I tried to create dances dealing with the Boyner crew, but for some reason it didn't elevate like I thought it was going to be. And sometimes you go through that. I mean, you didn't put this hot album out and they'd be waiting for the next hot. But I realized in African-American community, a lot of kids wasn't on cartoons, you know. So, so that kind of like slid me a little bit, but it made me think what I had to do. So... After that, I, I, I did my junior album, which is 20 Years in the Jet. I had a little battle with some local artists, and, and, I, and I realized that wasn't it. So one day, I was outside of a club, and somebody, you know, we did a concert at the little club up there called Escape, and, 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 and we was out there, and we was wondering why nobody didn't come to the concert. We had a few people came, but not that many came. So we had a new album release coming out, 20 Years in the Jets, and no one really came. So we stood outside the club like about two hours, man. We were just brainstorming and talking. And for some reason, some girl came out the door and she said, uh, people don't listen to that no more. They like that bounce, like cheeky black. So, and it, and it, and it hit me. And I'm like, wow. I said, okay. But I thought she was being negative, but, but by me being a smart person who don't get into it, I'm not a, I don't use, if somebody says say something negative, I don't go and call them all kinds of names. I stopped and I told her, I said, look, before I leave this game, I'm going to have you dancing and singing again. When I do, I'm going to bring you a tape, a CD, and a T-shirt. Before you know it, ah, check this out. We about getting ready, getting ready, getting ready, ready. Oh, it blew up. See when it blew up January 7, 1997? I made it my, my, my work to find her. And I happened to find her at a block party in the Iberville Project. She's from Iberville. And when I told her that story, she was amazing. When I walked up to her, I said, here you go. Here's your tape, CD, your poster and your t-shirt. And ever since that, we became friends ever since then. That's when I knew what my status was in the bounce music game and what my level was and what my music was all about. It's about dancing, making people dance, doing different creative dance. So that's been my forte over the years, from, from getting ready, getting ready to back that thing up, to hop in that circle, to walk with it. So that's been my main forte that elevated me up to where I'm at now today. But what happened was that uh, I wanted to give back 
where I grew up at that showed so much love to me over the years by DJing every front coat, every driveway, every block party, you know, I was there. I DJed in St. Thomas. So when I, when I came up with this album, I said, well, I need something to give back to the neighborhood to specify our name because everybody had a, a song about their project and their name. So when I say take it to the St. Thomas, we say roll with it. So that's where that creation of a take it to the St. Thomas, roll with it. So when we did that, and, and, and all the block parts, I did hundreds and hundreds of block parts in the St. Thomas. So shot video, first time any artist from out the St. Thomas ever shot a video in the St. Thomas was me. Stop pause in 93. So when we did that, that was my marking of the St. Thomas as far as that, hey man, this is where I grew up at. This is my home. This was made me because they all backed me everywhere I went, everywhere I go, everywhere I DJ, they backed me. I could DJ in another project. St. Tom was there. I could DJ in the Iverville, Lafitte, Mac Mouth Calio, St. Tom was there. And there ain't too many uh, places where people can go where you had a lot of enemies back then and project with beefing amongst each other. But when Jubilee there, they knew it was safe and they knew they were going to come to a good DJ, you know, and have fun. And that's what made my DJ and my music and my give back to St. Tom was so astronomical, you know, just big. Friends, friends, everybody who grew up during our era is not around anymore. You know, we got now we have the the fourth to fifth generation of young kids who mom probably got pregnant in '93, uh, who mom probably born in '93, around that time. You know, uh, it's not there no more. I mean, that St. Thomas, real love, because we stood our ground, we stood in our community, we ain't had to go nowhere. For us to have fun, we had fun in the St. Tom, we had to go outside. We know when we did a block party in the St. Tom, we knew we had a block party and everybody was gonna come. So that's what we basically lost is a lot of friendship. A lot of people who we grew up with, dead in jail, moved away, didn't move back for, you know, from Katrina, you know, and just being, being in the bricks to where that you knew it was, it was safe. I mean, even though we had a lot of uh, empty, uh, empty uh, apartment, but we was there. We can go in that front coat, play football. We can go in the next front coat, play football. Now we don't have that anymore. You know, we don't have any front coats. And we don't have any major, major streets where we hung out at, like on Fiel, which is Felicity Street, you know, which is Josephine, you know, which is which is Adidas Drive and stuff like that. We, I mean, we don't have that that personal comfort play where we can hang and congregate like we used to, without you know messing anybody else in the next neighborhood because that's what we did. We stood out all night long. We can. Uh, we used to have something we used to call all night flight. We went to sleep, step all night, and we know nothing was gonna happen. You know, we weren't gonna shoot or get killed or whatever. But now, since all that's gone and changed, now people move to different areas, different developments, and you know, it's gone. That's what we miss. In the name, you know, now it's River Garden. It used to be St. Thomas. You know, we still gonna call the tent wall St. Thomas, whatever. But just knowing that it's the River Garden is not there anymore. So. Well, I see that was going to be my next step because I wanted to use that year, 2010, as 2010 war. And I had an album set, ready to go, got ready to go work with a couple of producers, or maybe one producer who I know that can do my music, and another two who probably can do it. But for some reason, they got sidetracked. They got, somebody got inside their head, and, and, and now they want to do their own thing. And people say, well, if you do this for me, we're going to blow up. And. Every time I got ready to go to the studio, I set a date to go to the studio. When I get there, everybody knows Jubilee going to the studio. I got tons of people there. And they around here hanging around and they saying things. They, I'm, and I asked the guy, you know, hey man, I thought it was my date. So when I, when I felt, to me in my heart, I just felt like I've been blackballed. Meaning that Jubilee popular enough, or I don't want to do any tracks for them. I understand if I can, if I'm going to pay you, I'm going to do tracks. You know, you do track for free for everybody else, but I'm willing to pay you because I know what I have. And I seem like it's hard for me to catch up with you. That means you don't want to work with me. So that's why the fella 2010 wall didn't swing through. But I was able to get a couple of songs done, but not the ones I wanted 
to get done to make the album. So that's what I'm stuck in right now, two years later. Still, no producer. I call him, ask him what he's doing. You know, he always busy ripping around in and out of town, doing stuff for other people. But, you know, that, that's just part of the business. That's been going on for a long time. I felt that I've been blackballed, meaning that they know how popular I am. They know how hard I work in the studio. And they don't want to give me any studio. So I, you know, I don't have my own studio. So I just leave it like that. Make up things. I hear people use right now. You got people right now that will hear me at a DJ, what I'm saying, and go use it in, in their song and go by him and put it on the album. Or they'll call me. Uh, uh, Jubilee, are you going to use that, what you call them? Come on, man. You, know, you, can, you can have it because you're going to use it anyway. And why would you call me then the next day is on the album? Come on. You know, they already use So that's what it is right now with me for the music business. I can do it all many times because I don't get old because I'm still fresh out there doing music, still DJing from the Zulu club to club, make song in the French quarters. You know, I'm everywhere, so I'm still busy. Yeah, I say this Club Republic has been a, a, a cornerstone of the last few shows, meaning that I think I did close to 40 shows in Club Republic just by them keep showing me love. And I keep asking them, I'm like, whoa, they still want me? And I'm booked again, got another one coming this week. <laughs> so I'm there for like the 40, 50 time. And I did my 800 celebration there. Uh, when I did my 800 show, they showed me love, gave me a big birthday cake. And, and I did my 800 show there, which is good. So. You know, I just want to say big ups to the Republic, man. I mean, keep doing your thing. And they keep calling Jubilee, and I keep going. Obviously, it's going to be hard to do this event with the future that's coming up. But is there one that you can remember that sticks out in your mind as one that was your favorite event for whatever reason? I can't say. It's, 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 it's so many of my did there. It's, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it seems like it's always the same or a different crowd, but they still be crying. My memory one. Is it just being crowded, you know? When you know that you get ready to go, I tell you one that was shocking. I did two concerts at the Republic back to back. I did one for some high school kids that just graduated and had to come right back at eleven o'clock and do another whole show by myself. And I'm like, wow! And people came, so that was very memorable. That because you know, doing back to back shows in a venue like that that you just left out. They just put the kids out at 10 and you got to come back at 11 or 12 and do it again. And people actually wait around to 12 o'clock to get in to see you perform again. That's amazing. That's five stars. Yeah, that's amazing. Five yeah, that's amazing. What do you think has been the influence of uh, New Orleans, Brown, Zones, hip hop, rap, everything in general on um, not only music in the South, but uh, music all over the country? The different change of it, the different side of it, you know, the different elements that we keep bringing into it, you know, we didn't went from gangster to dancing to representing to the sissy bounds to to just the whole nine yards. And by them using the Internet and, and, and you know, doing personal videos now, like back then we didn't have videos like tomorrow you had to go pay tens and thousands of dollars to do a video. Now you take press up a couple buttons and your own personal phone and you can make a video or iPad, computer, whatever. You know, that's been the one big reason why I bounce me because it is where it is now. You know, I mean, some of it's good, some of it's not. You know, some of it eye catching. You know, but my big thing is about the music. I look for the sale of the product. I mean, anybody can shoot a video and show you, but we're not really selling numbers anymore like we used to when I was selling. And because you got a million hits on a video, it'd be a big value to you if you got a a, a million buyers who can buy that, that one video for a dollar or that one song for a dollar. See, a, a million viewers, yeah, anybody can see because it's different. And all you're doing is demonstrating a dance or a movement or some saying. But if you actually have a song that can carry that video, see, that's where people get lost at. They're watching a the movement. They don't have the song to, to uh, collaborate with that, what you call them, them dances. You know, so that's why it's, it's moving, but it's not moving. So a lot of people get caught up into the dance movement, the movement, instead of the music in the movement. And that's why it is right now. And I think uh, it was just more impressive uh, a while back because, you know, you have 500 sales for your tape or whatever. Yeah. That means 500 people left their house, drove somewhere. And, and pick up and bought it. That's a lot different than somebody just downloading it. Exactly, exactly. 
And then, you know, like I say, back then we sold tons of albums. You know, like I say, when, when Take Four ordered 500, then they ordered another 500, and then they got to the thousands on Stop Pause. Then it was a thousand, then a thousand, 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 thousand. That is the big difference between back then and now. I could put a, anybody could put a tape in the stores right now and they have dust on it. Back then, you got a hot tape on the street, you put it in the store, it was gone. Everybody had it, whether it was a tape, whether it was a CD, it was gone. And that's the big difference, see, and that's where locals understand that we made a lot of money off of tapes and CDs selling local mom and pop stores where you get money coming in and then you go do a show. So you got money coming in off the CD and you go do a show and make money. Right now they just see a little few dollars doing a show, you know, blah, 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 whatever it is. But I wish them days can come back to where that you can sell your product, really sell your product and really, really make quality product to sell. You know, a lot of people, they just putting out anything, any tape, any CD, in, you know, especially in the bounce music. And I was hurting the bounce music because we're not putting out quality music. We'll put out a video which you see on the street that iPad showing and everybody hit you. Now, I, mean, I want you to get it done right. I want you to edit it right. I want you to do it right the way it's supposed to be done. Then maybe we can turn that over and start making it to a good song and then start selling a song and not just the, what they see. Well, uh, before the music, while like I say, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say this again to all my interviews. I wish people go home and write instead of just running, grabbing the mic and say everything, and let the DJ or the engineer in the studio put your words together and make your song for you. See, that's what's going on now. The engineer is making their songs for them by sampling their voices and sampling they, whatever they say, and then he making it to a song. Then they go do a concert thing as a whole song. Nah. Are you sampling off somebody else's words or singing on top of somebody else's song and thinking that's a song? No, that's not a song. So I tell people, go home, you got to write. Because if you write a word called a wooka 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 wooka, if that's a word, then you spell it out for me. You know, but that's what I mean by we, they, they make a different sound effect, but not really making words. So they, to me, if, if you write it into a phrase and perform it, then you might get a better result. That's what I tell a lot of these rappers who, who sit down and ask me questions, like, like the young cat who asked me a question named Lucky Lou. He said, man, how you get so high? How you stay high so long? I say you got to be original. You got to create. You got to write. You just can't go out and grab a mic, which is he doing it the right way, but he don't have that hit yet. I told him you got to get a hit song. When you get a hit song, then people are going to start noticing you. And that's why a lot of these artists who out now, who, who's in the bounce music, you know, if you look at the PNC, you look at the the, uh, the Miss T, you know, the people who really got lyrics, you know, in their music where you can sell a few people, can, you know, go to and enjoy it. You know, but like I said, New Orleans changed. And you got to change with it sometimes. Sometimes you, you know, you get lost in it like me. Right now I'm kind of lost in it because I don't want to follow that path of what they're doing because it's not selling. I'm more of of a person, if you sell something and people go buy it, they truly do love it because they went out and go get it for you. So that's putting food on your table, not just putting on video and everybody getting your hits and you ain't getting nothing. So that's the big difference right there. People going to buy it. Paul, do you have any questions? Good. 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 All right. I can't say uh, 20, uh, 2012. Well, I, I ain't from there. <laughs> <laughs> 2012. 